Um, so for anyone watching, thanks for tuning in. Um, as part of our Together Alone programming during quarantine, um, Special Special is presenting a series of interviews. Uh, I'm currently the art director at Special Special. Uh, we're a gallery shop and producer of art editions based in East Village, New York. Um, and joining me today is uh, James Cruzan. Uh, so thank you, James. Um, James is an artist, writer, musician based in Ridgewood, New York. Uh, his work engages in the long tradition of the dematerialized art object. He founded the Ridgewood Community Seed Vault in 2019 and curates the non-corporeal fine art gallery called Famous Chimp. Uh, a collection of new poems called Nice Job Haunting Me was published by Puppy American in 2019. Narcissus, Pseudo Narcissus, an opera in two acts written with Rachel Hillary will premiere in 2020. Uh, James plays drums in a band called Tulip Maze Music under uh, the name My Life as a Kinetic Sculpture. Um, James is also a graduate of the MFA Studio Art Program at Hunter College um, and had recently been uh, guest resident at the Hercules Art Studio Program. Um, so James, thanks for joining me. Uh, you have bio. Uh, what? You have quite the bio. So um, hopefully yeah. we sort of shed some light on some of these different. Yeah. Um, so I was introduced to James' work um, by another artist and mutual friend, Patrick Carlin Mahunt, um, who runs the seasonal operation Pad Gallery, which uh, I think James knows uh, pretty well and has participated in. Um, a quick shout out to Patrick and Pad Gallery. Um, so James, uh, you're one of 32 artists included in our most recent exhibition, Artist Tools. Um, and as with most exhibitions we host, uh, we collaborate with the artist, with um, one of the exhibiting artists to produce um, new additioned works for the occasion of the exhibition. So this time we were fortunate uh, to collaborate with you to produce a series of works on paper. Um, so a little bit about that. Uh, James provided an instrument called a high growth, which records temperature and humidity in a given space. Uh, and the special special edition drawings are produced automatically by the high growth thermograph during the exhibition. Uh, so each site specific drawing records changes in the temperature and humidity of the gallery on a custom chart paper, completing one rotation uh, every 24 hours. So I'm wondering if, um, James, if you can talk a little bit about sort of how you arrived at that idea for a series of drawings, um, even like prior to submitting it to our open call for artist tools, um, and maybe how you're thinking about this edition has changed um, given like the specific time we're in and, and the sort of quarantine period. Yeah. Um... I uh, was really kind of, I guess, bored with art that hung on the wall or, or was on a um, podium or whatever it's called, a sculpture is on. Um, and got really interested in like the sort of things that go around um, that are on the walls in a gallery but aren't art per se. Um, and I had always noticed the hyperthermographs in museums, um, just in the corner of some galleries, and always was sort of interested in them. And I ended up finding a few on eBay for like relatively cheap and just sort of buying it um, and getting my hands on the like official chart paper too, that they make special for them. Um, and just started started playing around with it in my studio, probably like two and a half years ago, maybe. Um, and then it ended up becoming an element of my thesis project. Uh, it got installed at the 205 Hudson Gallery, among a bunch of other things. And that's when I started also making sort of special chart paper for it that would, that sort of like, in a way defeated the purpose of the measurements didn't tell what was being recorded anymore. Um, but that was fine with me. It was more about just making the model knowing that it was a, a time sensitive, time and place sensitive sort of mark being made. Um, 
and that has sort of extended into the special special show, which originally it was supposed to run one chart a day, and we made I think eighty one prints originally of a custom special special chart paper, but pretty much like the day after the opening, the whole city got shut down and no one could go to the gallery anymore to change it, um, at least not every day. Um, so it's still, it, it's sort of perfectly still maintains its purpose of like recording a specific time and place. And that time and place has become like New York City during this pandemic and everyone is stuck at home and no one can go to the gallery. I, you guys just posted some images of it to um, your story, I think, and they look pretty cool with all because they just, they just, it's just a spinning drum and pens draw on it as it rotates. Um, and so it just spins and spins. And so there's like 20 lines going on it, on yeah. it right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we kind of talked to you about this a little bit, like how we should handle this edition. Right. Uh, original to create one drawing over 24 hours for each day of the exhibition, uh, which was initially gonna run for 81 days. So I think we had that all figured out. And then of course, like you're saying, kind of was per fine um, for us to start this edition series and then uh, sort of have to make an adjustment. So um, it's kind of like has a really sort of unique set of circumstances, I think, um, that sort of make these even more, uh, more of like a special record of this time, I think. Um, so you said that you modified the chart paper, um, and we kind of worked on this together. Mm -hmm. uh, rip out a lot of lines in the in the paper, um, kind of abstract the actual measurements. Right. You're thinking and like kind of removing some of that baseline information from the chart paper. Um, I think it one making like a new chart paper. Um, it kind of turns it into an art object in, in some ways. Um, where if it was just running the like, uh, like the spec chart paper, it would just sort of be the thing that it is. Um, and I'm really interested in sort of it, it like losing one purpose and gaining another purpose, I think. And so that original purpose had to be sort of taken out in some ways, I think, for it to really sort of be its own um thing i guess yeah certainly and you added a, a sort of poetic line also right the i've been adding um words to them for since i started doing the project and this one has a line from a david berman poem that i think it's um these words are meant to mark this day on earth I um, and that just sort of for me reinforces the, the I know we had, we had talked about changing that line to say like these lines are meant to mark this day on earth. Um, and for me, it's really important that like the whole project hinges on this like poetic reinterpretation of the the paper and the the object. And so kind of bringing it back into language by saying these words um, really brought it up a notch or something <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think that line relates to um, sort of like obscuring some of the exact measurements. It's it's about the exact and more about the fact that there is a line drawn is is enough. I think just to mark that this day happened and it's just a record of of that day, I guess, and and so, sort of the passing of time. Um, uh, so, yeah, as you mentioned, we we just earlier today posted a bunch of images of the drawings, uh, recent drawings. I think we had one up for, it was rotating for three weeks or so. Um, so like after the, like check out some of the images um, we put on our story um, uh -oh. and we'll, we'll continue to share the images and make all the drawings available for purchase. Um, so anybody that's interested, just send us a message at special special. Uh, and we'll get you more info. Um, so James, you also have a, another piece in the show um, called 718-554-3854, which is a phone number uh, that you've written on a series of 20 matchbooks um, that when dialed leads you through 
um, a fairly poetic auditory experience. Um, is this an ongoing for you? Uh, yeah, the phone number started sort of the same way the, the hyperthermograph came from the same place, I think, with um, looking for ways that the art experience could be sort of removed from how it existed in the gallery. Um, and I got the phone number probably two years ago. And originally the project was uh, every day I would write something and record um, I was using a speech synthesis program to record it being spoken and then uploading that to the phone number. Uh, and then for my thesis at Hunter, I ended up making a way more ambitious version that has, I can't remember how many recordings, but it's, I think it's like a 36 stanza poem and each stanza is in, is each stanza is uh, recorded separately. And when you dial the phone number, it prompts you to press any key to continue. And as you press more and more buttons, um, it's just, uh, it just goes deeper and deeper. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like how you, you've described them as rooms. Also. Right. Sort of using the dial pad to uh, enter new rooms. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole like map drawing of it and there's a lot, it's a pretty like convoluted, to arrive at that but uh yeah they are i mean to me they are each are, of them are rooms and some of them have like music playing in them and different voices speak the different poem um or parts of the poem yeah okay yeah definitely also encourage people to check that one out um yeah. posted the images online also with the phone number uh so why matchbook for, for presenting the phone number? Um, I think there's a couple reasons. Uh, there's definitely something like really romantic to getting a phone number written in a matchbook um, that doesn't really happen anymore, I think, in um, I, I don't know if it ever happened to anyone or if it just happened in movies or something. Um, uh, but I was playing with that and also the idea of just a book being like a vehicle for language and the matchbook and that sort of like pun, um, a lot of it turns on that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I like, I really like, I make these like really customized matchbooks and I've been like marbling the paper, the, like the cardstock that they're folded into and um, reassembling them. And uh, each one has, e each edition is 20 matchbooks. And there are, the number of the edition is um, signified by which match of the original 20 matches in the matchbook is uh, removed. And then I keep those matches um, as a separate piece almost. Um, mm -hmm. So they so are, there are, they are consumable and disposable in a lot of ways, but there is something also like special about them. And as soon as you start using the matches, then you lose track of what edition it is or what edition it is. And I'm interested in that sort of tenuous space that they're in. Right, right. Very much a functional object still, but um, right. also a vehicle to, you, to your project. Right. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, that piece is also included in our show Artist Tools. Uh, so kind of going off of the, the pieces we've already talked about. Um, so those are not the only pieces of yours that have sort of taken on a uh, new or different sort of significance um, once you've put them out into the world. Uh, could you tell us about a piece you made called Winter Tarot? Right. Um, Winter Tarot was a project that started from a quote I read on a Wikipedia page about calendars, I think. Um, and it was talking about an ancient Roman calendar where the days of spring, summer, and fall were numbered and given individual days. Winter was just labeled as this group of time, this like span of time that had no differentiation between the days. And I guess it ended at some point and spring started again and you could count the days. And 
I was interested in that sort of interpretation of time. Um, and I, it was just winter was ending and I had just gone through like a really cold and dark winter. And um, I thought it was really like winter, I think for a lot of people is still experienced as that sort of formless span of time. Um, mm -hmm. So I made, I was interested in tarot um, and a lot of my friends were doing tarot readings um, or talking about their tarot and it was just sort of in the air. And I, so I made this deck of, it's 81 cards, 80 cards. Um, mm. but they're I, all identical. It's the, the jizz. Right. And so they are, they're based on the Rider White tarot art, um, which is like the most common deck. Um, and they just have this blue blank field um, and the title winter. And I ended up getting the, uh, I ended up being introduced to someone who had been reading tarot for like a decade or something, seven years or, um, they'd been doing it a really long time and they also happened to be like a, so a social worker. And so they had this sort of really empathetic way of doing it. and. I was interested, initially interested in like the cards being sort of a joke, or like a one liner of like, you can't tell anything about your future because it's just endless time. Um, and I had, I met up with her at a coffee shop and had her read my cards with the Winter Tarot deck. And it was actually pretty like accurate. And um, she had a lot of experience scrying, which is the basis for uh, crystal balls as well, which is just sort of gazing into an object and kind of letting things reveal themselves to you. Um, and so she used that, the, bl the blank blue fields um, in a similar sort of way uh, to, to get things out of the deck. And she ended up reading um, cards at a pad gallery a few years ago on the street in Soho, which is really great. And a lot of people had pretty emotional experience getting their cards read with that deck. She also read one of my professor's cards during a crit um, at Hunter. And my professor made everyone leave the room afterwards and had like a private conversation with the tarot reader after because it was such an accurate reading, I think. And sort of she wanted some more information that she wasn't ready for the class to, to be uh, in on. It was pretty crazy. They really yeah. sort of got me in the end, which was really cool. And the, I gave the tarot reader that deck too, so now she has it. And I like to think she still pulls it out sometimes to do a reading. I hope so. It sounds like maybe that will let it, let it live its like truest life. Right, if, exactly. It's nice yeah. to know it's out there. Um, yeah, pretty so like what what is uh seemingly or initially um kind of a straightforward uh take on this um right. popular thing the the tarot deck like has become something so much more um to the yeah. point where you handed it over yeah <laughs> uh so i guess something i kind of noticed about like a piece of that and uh even like the high growth thermograph drawings um, in a lot of your work, you're sort of creating tools or, or a set of circumstances um, that kind of have this potential to be activated by the viewer or uh, right. some way. So like, is this, I'm wondering, do you feel like this becomes apparent um, only sort of when you look back on the projects or are you setting out to create something that can be activated or taken to a new place uh, that's a little bit out of your control? Uh, I, I am definitely interested in that and a lot of the projects I think um, sort of come out of a desire to have it be interactive and somehow and somehow um, sort of involve the audience in a, in a non-traditional viewing way, um, I think, uh, which is really exciting for me when I see art like that and um, I've never been like a painter or like a, a sculptor or someone who makes something to just be looked at, I think. Um, mm. 
And so working like that sort of, um, yeah, I don't know, it comes mm. really, I guess, in a way. Yeah, or it sounds like it comes out of being a fan of art or a certain type of art that kind yeah, of yeah. It is, is similar to what you want to give other people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I want to go through a, a couple more specific pieces. Uh, I really like the, this piece of yours called Mockingbird. Um, I'm wondering if, if you think about if I show it on camera um, with, a, with some audio and then you can talk about it a little bit. Is that yeah, cool? Is that your yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm just on James' website. Um, here's the piece called Mockingbird. like what you're thinking about in making this piece because um, I think like you're at least my initial viewing of it it's fairly straightforward almost like a little bit tongue-in-cheek or ironic or or humor based but um, I feel like hearing from you there's there's definitely more to it and, and I think like if you were to engage with this in a space as a viewer uh, you would probably get a lot more than this sort of initial Right. Um, I think at the time, and, and still today, I was really interested in um, the sort of division that uh, humans have put between like humanity and nature and this like kind of hard line. I feel like we always are off. Um, and I was interested in, hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was in, I was interested in the sort of or origin of an alarm clock is uh, birds singing in the morning when the sun comes up and sort of it was the like original signal to wake up and I feel like that iPhone ringtone uh, a, lot, a lot of people have like a really visceral experience of that as well and I was interested in sort of this. Uh, the project is the speaker is playing the mockingbird sound pretty low. Um, and as you approach the speaker in the space, um, a sensor sort of switches it to the a really kind of blaring iPhone ringtone. And it's supposed to, you know, pull you back and you can never get to the actual bird sound because it's switching it. And yeah, it's easier to explain in the video, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, I think for me, when I saw it, um, yeah, something clicked right away. Like I definitely have personally, like, I don't, I can't use that alarm anymore just because it right. sort of had creation. So I think there's something really immediate, really nice and immediate about that piece. Right. Um, okay. Uh, I also want to mention like to anyone watching, if you want to ask a question, um, just type it out in the comment and I'll try to get to it towards the end. Uh, feel free to do that. Uh, so James, you're you're in a band right now, and you have a solo music project also. Right. And you practice too. It seems like pretty consistently you're incorporating like a an audio or music component. Um, so I'm wondering, like, has music been always been important to you? Are you do you come from a musical family? How has this kind of uh, led to your how has this sort of like formed the path to where you are as an artist now? My um, parents um, play music. My dad still plays keyboards in a Grateful Dead cover band in Chicago. Um, and uh, both my sisters were also in like high school band um, and orchestra. And I was 
in the orchestra at high school and wait sorry james do you want to repeat like the last sentence or so you kind of broke up yeah. i was playing upright bass in the orchestra in high school um and i was originally i, th I thought going gonna go to college for like music performance um or composition or something um i was taking a lot of like music theory courses um and i had a private for the for the bass um who pretty quickly after lesson realized that i wasn't actually interested in like playing mozart or bach or or that sort of stuff we were playing in the orchestra I'm definitely not interested in like practicing to be good enough to be um pursuing that i think um <laughs> but he kind of identified like these other interests i had um and introduced me to like Steve Reich and like John Cage and like Terry Riley and all these composers from the 60s who were on the conceptual art. Um, uh, you know, like John Cage and like Yoko Ono and, and that whole like milieu. Um, so I got introduced, introduced to that in high school and really sort of latched onto it and figured out that like visual art was an easier way for me to get into that point than going to music school. I ended up to art school and starting on this path and um but definitely sound and music have always been in my head and i've always played in bands um yeah and just i think it's just a certain way of working and and like uh thinking about scores and things like that um that uh definitely influences pretty much everything i think yeah yeah I you can definitely see that, I think, in the work. Um, so if you're you're sort of on this line or or back and forth between basically just a, like a musician and a, a visual artist or a conceptual artist, uh, personally, do you feel like there's much distinction um, in in like those labels? Or do you feel like the creative process or your creative process is kind of flexible enough to to sort of transfer to either application. Probably that keeps it. Um, okay. Yeah. Personally, there isn't. I don't really think of a distinction. Um, I th I think there's like distinctions in like the projects I'm doing. Like, there's a distinction between like making like pop or like punk music with bands, writing an opera, but um, my like I just sort of go between things and don't really think about it too much. Um, they're all just things I'm working on, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. You, does that mean sort of exploring the medium that you think best suits whatever you're trying to say? I'm I'm interested in certain mediums um, and sort of pursue them uh, according to that interest. Sorry, everyone. We'll get James back in just a minute. Until then, I'll play some music from James um, under uh, his solo project called My Life as a Kinetic Sculpture. some of your music for a uh, brief intermission cool <laughs> all right uh hopefully this room is better well, we'll see no it's it seems a bit better um but i think you were saying so i just had asked if, if you see much distinction between you know going between being a musician and conceptual or visual artist and uh i think you're basically saying no not really <laughs> pretty much um yeah 
certain yeah certain projects for certain mediums and certain mediums for certain projects and moving back and forth it yeah i don't know it just sort of happened yeah it continued to happen i think that's kind of the answer you, that that you hear a lot from people that are able to like effectively do both right um, or if, i guess just your mindset or what you're trying to accomplish with a given uh so um for people watching they just heard a little bit of music uh the last the most recent thing on your disc discography is uh called hex studies um uh, right. about a little and i know that this this music is part of kind of a larger exploration and and maybe it's a little bit difficult to summarize but I'm wondering if you could tell us uh about the premise or where the reference to a hexagon comes from and how that translates to the music that we hear right the hex studies were part of my thesis project we wrapped it the sort of picture of the phone number space that you um travel through sort of audio wise um is based on this tessellation of hexagons, which is actually a hexagonal chessboard. Um, and the movement, the lines drawn on it are the way a, a knight would move. Um, it's called a knight's tour. It's an old sort of math problem, trying to figure out if a, the knight piece moving as it does in the sort of L shape can visit each space on the chessboard. Uh, <laughs> And the hex studies were sort of based on graphic yes. scores um, that were made based on that sort of tessellation and the same movement that um, the phone number project was using. Hello? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, getting James to join back into the video right now. Hey. Hey. Cool. Okay. Uh, internet. Yeah, no worries. Uh, clearer than ever. Clearer than ever, I think. Um, <laughs> so we were talking about uh, hex studies. Um, I was showing there's kind of these accompanying graphics uh, that can also be found in a version of the phone number project. Um, I think one of the questions in the chat was, uh, I think you started talking about this. Um, the Does the way that you move through the rooms in, in the phone number piece um, correlate to this type of movement or? Uh, right. The, um, the hexagons. It, it, the, um, when you press a button in the phone piece, you move to a different room on this hexagonal map. Um, mm. and the pitches of the, the hex study compositions, um, move in a way where the, uh, each space in the, on the hex grid, um, was assigned a note value. And then the note, notes of the melody and the harmony are based on a night's tour of that space, which is the exact same way you move through, um, the phone number piece. Okay. Uh, is, are those obviously related, like, or is that sort of an Easter egg? Uh, the, phone, if you know the, the hex studies were installed in the thesis show as well, and mm -hmm. that music can be heard within the phone number piece. Um, but I think a lot of it is sort of like buried pretty deep. I, I don't know if you can get to, I don't know if any of that's really obvious, other than in sort of um the the way it's experienced and the way the music is and the it's sort of this pseudo random sort of experience i think um or or an ordered experience that you're not sure exactly how it's being ordered um and i'm interested in that sort of um way of experiencing art and, and way of experiencing things that and I think a lot of nature is like that and a lot of everything is like that, where you're not exactly sure how it is, how it's happening, but there is a structure underneath everything. Right, right. Again, I think 
Um, I would encourage people to listen to Hex Studies. Uh, again, James is putting out this under the name My Life as a Kinetic Sculpture. And I think the way it sounds is a lot like you're describing. Um, you can tell there's a there's an order to it and there's a system. Uh, it's, the music is composed, but it's not immediately apparent. And um, to me, I don't know a lot about music technically, but um, you can, I think you can pick up like some manipulation of the scales and, and things like that. Like you have a, a clear system um, that I think kind of extends across a lot of your work. Uh, but like, and like you're just saying about uh, these sort of perceptions of, of like this, um, and, and things that are seemingly manipulated or experienced differently than, than we immediately understand them. Uh, you have another piece. Um, I want to get the title right. Uh, People have to synchronize to animal time. Um, right. That features your cat, which you're holding right now. Right. Um, People have to synchronize to animal time uh, is a super eight film. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually, I think, I think it's a complete cartridge of Super 8 film shot of this cat um, here, uh, sleeping on my bed. Um, and it's played through a, uh, through a computer program that randomizes the frame rate that it's played back at. Um, so it, standard frame rate is 24 frames a second, and that's sort of the um, normal speed it's traveling at. And every 24 frames, the frame rate will change to a, a random different speed. Um, and you can see the frames are uh, ticking out there. Um, kitten. Yeah, and, and people have to synchronize the animal time is coming out of a Silver Jews lyric, which is also David Berman from the uh, chart paper quote. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just. the early I think um, his name is Jacob von Weckul U-E-X-U-L-L um, and he has this whole theory about different sort of life worlds every different object and creature has a different life world or, or way of experiencing their world um, and that piece I think is about sort of accepting that your house cat or any really anything has a different sort of life experience and a different experience of time and trying to figure out and acknowledge those sort of different time scales that they're moving at. Um, you know, like a, a tree lives for like a hundred years and I'm going to live for like 70 years and the cat lives for 20, hopefully. Um, so like each and every, every life is condensed into those different sort of frames. Um, so animal time is, in theory, faster, or they experience things at a different speed than us. And that's, so that's what this is about. And the sort of randomized frame rate um, is meant to sort of um, throw you off and, and make you realize that like, the speed that things are moving at is not the only speed that things can move at. Um, and, but it is the only speed you can experience, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. but yeah yeah i think so you broke up a little bit but uh we were talking about about the way i came to understand it is the randomized frame rate in this video sort of represents the the element of mystery in the way that we understand right uh, other animals or other species kind of perception of time my cat is being a troublemaker right now trying to drink my water Uh, okay, so I think a few more things, um, like I read your bio in the beginning and, you know, there's a lot there, so I want to at least touch on a, a few more, if you're okay with that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so Famous Chimps, this is a gallery that uh, you started in early 2019 as a newsletter-based gallery. Uh, right. So I want to ask you about this. 
um, one point of interest um, coming from Special Special, uh, we've been doing art via email since around the same time, actually, uh, right. under a project called Show and Tell. Um, and now, like, now under the current circumstances, we're seeing um, really like a major increase in alternative programming by galleries. Right. Uh, and you initiated Famous Chimps to be uh, newsletter based um, and not a physical location from the start. Right. Is that correct? Definitely. So how did that, how did it get started? And, and what would you say are your objectives as a curator? Um, well, how it got started is, is one of my day jobs is editing the Hunter Art Department's newsletter, um, which is a, a weekly newsletter done through MailChimp. Um, so I am on MailChimp all the time and working in that interface um, and was getting really interested in sort of, I don't, I don't know if you've used MailChimp or um, something similar. Oh, yes. Yeah. Like all those websites sort of operate on like these like weird like building blocks. It's sort of a clumsy interface. Um, Absolutely. And, and they're, it's really frustrating. <laughs> and uh, I was basically interested in... Uh, and it goes along with a lot of other projects, sort of like moving things outside of a gallery setting. Uh, and on your phone or your computer is like a perfect place. Um, gallery now. Um, mm -hmm. And each resident and artist has um, a month where they have access to the MailChimp account. Um, and they can do pretty much whatever they want. Um, and so they're, they're allowed to do, you know, like a one-off thing or a lot of people choose to um, sort of spend time developing um, sort of like a serialized piece. Um, someone right now is doing, uh, Dina Kelberman is doing a, an email every day um, that you should subscribe to. Um, it's really okay. great. How can we subscribe? Uh, the subscribe link is on the website, which is famouschimps.com. Um, I think it's a, the link is in my bio too, um, on Instagram. Uh, yeah, and so, and the curatorial premise is sort of, I have, I had a lot of friends who were curating things and putting me in shows and it, I mean, it pretty much is like a blatant, like, I just wanted to give my friends a space to do something. Um, and it's really become a place where people can really experiment and do things that they aren't usually doing because it, it's such a sort of strict environment. Um, and it's, it's become a really exciting place and we're just starting to sort of reach out to people who I'm not, um, I don't personally know um, very well and it's sort of building. and. What's nice about it is every time a new artist takes over, they promote it um, and the audience grows, they stay subscribed to the next artist. So everyone sort of brings their community to it um, and it builds and builds. Um, and it, it's pretty like low maintenance, which is nice because I'm doing so many other things um, and it's self-sufficient in a lot of ways. So yeah, it's kind of, it's just a nice little small project to give people a chance to do something sort of strange and to give them a long time to do it, um, which I think mm -hmm. is key. Where I, I, there's a lot of other like newsletter projects, I think that um, they sort of exist as sing singular emails for an artist. And I mm -hmm. think with a span of time is an, an important aspect of famous for me at least. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it seems like you've you've been managing it really well and I think to me is that we, we kind of lose uh, we're at a point where we've kind of lost a lot of the site specific nature of uh, right. work physical galleries um, but I think this kind of is an opportunity to do a version of that in the digital space uh, right. where you're you're kind of making something that's suited to the way it's being shown or um, yeah yeah I think do you see that connection at all like how how it was more common or it was easier for people in the past to maybe make something in a gallery physically, like show up and make something for that gallery. Right. But I lost that a little bit, um, right. or, or actually. 
yeah, so I do think, you see? Yeah, definitely. I think there's like a lot of connections with like zine culture too, and like sort of making things for this format. And one of the rules for Famous Chimps, I think probably the only rule for Famous Chimps is um, that it has to exist inside the MailChimp editor. Um, so you can't like link to some program you have on a different website. It has to be in the email. Um, so it's a pretty kind of strict circumstance that people have to work with. Um, and it does become, like you said, sort of a site specific experience. Um, a lot of the work sort of riffs on like email form letters and chain letters and things like that. And um, yeah. um, it's sort of this self-referential email experience, um, which has been really interesting to see all these really talented artists make pretty amazing things. All the, all the emails are archived on the website, famouschimps.com. Mm. Um, and it's every month. So there's like, I think six, 16, 14, 15. I think we're on our 16th show or artist. Um, it's kind of, it's fun. Uh, yeah, I don't know. They're Great. Cool. I hope you keep it going. Uh, yeah, how, yeah. how far ahead are you? Are you planned out? Uh, it's very last minute. Um, I have next, I have someone for next month. Um, but no one, I have some like ideas of people who have been like, I might want to do one at some point. Um, but right. it's, it, it's sometimes it's very last minute. Um, yeah, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty casual. Um, if anyone wants to do one, uh, <laughs> hit me up. Like it's pretty yeah. open. I like, I like it being sort of a, it's, really sort of like an anti-gallery in a lot of ways, I think, um, where there's not that high of a bar set for the artists who want to do something. And if they have a good idea, we uh, I do it. Um, and it's just nice. I don't know. Put Definitely. Your... Definitely. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we need these avenues for artists yeah. to not, not feel so um, tied to their, I don't know their reputation or, or fitting the work into their larger body. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate what you're doing with that. Yeah. Um, are you going to subscribe now? I, don't, <laughs> I, I wasn't familiar or like I hadn't um, looked through it. Um, yeah. It's probably a secret in a lot of ways, um, yeah. which I, I personally am into that. Um, yeah, I think it plays into the the digital nature or or the Easter egg kind of. Yeah. Okay, so the last the last uh, major project I want to talk about is the opera, because um, that's yeah. that's your going project, right? Right. Uh, so you're working on this with uh, another artist, Rachel Hillary, who's a fellow Hunter grad. Right. We were we were in the same class um, and in the same thesis show. Um, and we got to know each other really well. And I always admired her work. Uh, and sort of once, um, once thesis and grad school sort of wrap up, we were looking for ways to sort of like stay connected and maintain a community uh, that we had developed in grad school. And um, we sort of had this idea, let's do an opera and knowing like very little about how operas are made um, or what it entails. But I had been working more and more with sort of traditionally notated music for musicians to play and not sort of like rock band, uh, you know, punk music. Um, and she has been developing uh, like a performance and it's, it's not, it's, uh, there's like a, a relationship with language and performance of language that has been really interesting uh, to me. And we just sort of decided to like do an opera and we've been working on it for like a year now. Um, <laughs> we just finished a, it ended up having to be a virtual table read of the first scene of the first act because we couldn't meet in person. Um, but it was the first sort of like trial run of the music and the words and um, it's for five voices. So we had five of our friends uh, zoom in to this 
at the same time and I'm editing the video right now and it, it is coming out really well, um, which we're excited about. Cool. Um, applying for grants because an offer is an expensive thing to um, do uh, to pay people and make sets and stuff. So yeah, that's where we're at. <laughs> right. And I think you told me that you're hoping to uh, put on the show at, towards the end of the year. Right. I mean, we were originally hoping that um, my piano, unfortunately, right now is stuck in Manhattan and I'm in Ridgewood. Um, so we've kind of had to stop uh, writing new material, or at least I've had to stop writing new material. Um, and we've been focused on sort of this weird variation, um, a virtual variation of trying to get the uh, first scene in some sort of format we can use to apply to things with. Um, so I think we originally wanted it to be in fall uh, of this year, but I think we'll have to push it back to spring because of this whole stay at home business. But uh, yeah, it's, I, it's going swimmingly other than that. That's great. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm excited for that. I think we, we talked about the other day, how that used to be a thing in New York or, or like a, there's a story, um, I think Rachel told me the story originally, um, Lori Anderson during like the 70s was walking down the street in the East Village and every artist she'd pass, she'd ask like, how's your opera going? And they'd discuss their different operas. And there's, so there was a time in New York where like seemingly everyone was writing an opera. Um, and we were kind of really excited uh, by that and wish more people would write operas with us and sort of jump, jump into this weird thing. Um, yeah. But it's um, such a back. elaborate art form. Um, there's so much, it's just really exciting um, to be doing something and to be committed to something so long-term, I think is um, nice. Not just small projects, you know, um, but a big ambitious thing. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think you, you mentioned also that you have friends performing in it. Uh, right. My last, my last sort of question is: um, in a lot of your work, you kind of there's a strong element of community or sense of community, or you treat the viewer uh, as a community member, or you're inviting them to to a shared experience or relatable experience. So yeah. to me, that read through a lot of your work, and I'm wondering how uh, does the influence of like a sense of community relate to like the idea or or time working in solitude, which is usually like some component of an artist's practice? Um, yeah, I, I think I just like hanging out with people. Um, and I have a bunch of like amazing friends uh, in New York um, and we just make art together and it just feels sort of natural um, to be making work like that. Um, and I, you know, it's coming out of playing bands for years, I think. Um, I am lucky enough to be playing in a band with like two of my best friends. And, and it, you know, it's, and me and Rachel are really close friends. Um, and it's just nice to be surrounded by interesting and kind people. Um, also are like brilliant and making amazing art. And it's sort of like the, the dream of moving to New York, I think, um, finding that community. Um, and I found it, which is like pretty crazy to me still. <laughs> yeah, no, it's amazing. I think, I think that is one of the biggest reasons people are here. Yeah. Uh, I think it shows in the work too, in the best way. Ooh, yeah. yeah, it's great. Uh, <laughs> it's nice having friends. <laughs> yeah. yeah, shout out to friends. Shout out to friends. Uh, and my special, special friends. Thank you. <laughs> we had we had one question from someone watching a while back. Uh, they want to know about the seed vault. Maybe we can ask the seed vault. And they want to know, what's the seed vault and is it for the apocalypse? Right. Uh, the seed vault is um, the Ridgewood Community Seed Vault, which mm -hmm. I started here. Um, it is a 
it's modeled off of the Svalbard seed vault in Norway, um, which is where sort of seed depositories all over the world send their seeds to be like cryogenically preserved in case of um, global catastrophe. And so I started a version of that um, for people I know here um, in New York. And it's just sort of a lockbox in my freezer. Um, and anyone can submit a seed or they want to be stored uh, there. They do sign away some rights, um, including like the right for the seed vault to like disappear and reappear their seeds um, or plant them. And so, uh, yeah, it, in the event of the apocalypse, um, I wouldn't count on the Ridgewood Community Seed Vault uh, coming to anyone's rescue. Uh, it's first and foremost, I think, a conceptual art project, but um, it would be amazing if it could be uh, expanded into something that is a serious, um, you know, safeguard against the inevitable, you know. Right. Yeah, just give it some time. Yeah, yeah, it's slowly growing. If if anyone has a seed they'd like to submit, um, literally any seed from like the core of your apple or like your garden out, out on your fire escape, um, let me know. Send me a DM. Send me an email. We'll set it. A socially seed swap. I have a lot of nice sort of ephemera that you get from getting a seed. So everyone should, if they have access to seeds, just let me know. Okay. I would, <laughs> I would love to do it. I'll let to find a seed just to have the experience, I think, of putting one into the vault. And... Yeah, yeah. I definitely encourage everyone to do it. Um... Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I think I covered, we covered a lot, I feel like. Um, yeah. I wonder if there's anything you want to plug or anything or uh, any you want to talk about at the end here? Um, no, I don't. Uh, subscribe to Famous Chimps at famouschimps.com. Um, submit to the Seed Vault. Um, mm -hmm. Listen to Julep Maisie. Uh, my friend who... All, so Julep Maisie has a band camp and is on Spotify. And then my friend Danny just put out a really good new album under the name Lucky Frog, which is on Spotify. Um, check that out. My Life as a Kinetic Sculpture isn't on Spotify because of I'm like a secretive person, I guess, but it's on Bandcamp. <laughs> um, so you can listen to it there. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think those are those are good recommendations. So I, I would encourage everyone also like about Bandcamp. Um, I played, when you got disconnected, I played a little bit of Hex Studies for a minute. Yeah, um, yeah on there. Yeah, I've been listening to it a lot. Uh, super <laughs> relaxed. Yeah. Yeah. So. Sick. Yeah. My so friend, my friend Joe Palindrani um, performed those, uh, and now he's in law school. So he's a multi-talent. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, yeah. If anyone that's that's watching, if you want to hear the music, um, stop by Bandcamp. Uh, Julep Maisie or My Life as a Kinetic Sculpture. Uh, some of the projects I showed are um, from James's website, jamescruzan.com, C H R Z A N, right? And if I find out any more about Special Special or uh, our most recent exhibition about artist tools, just go to specialspecial.com. Um, and yes, yeah, stay tuned for more content like this. Um, we'll be doing more interviews and stuff like this but mostly yeah i just want to thank you james for your time um yeah. it's been a pleasure talking about your work and i think a lot more good conversations to be had hopefully yeah thanks so much all right cool thank you james bye all right have a good night you too